John chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, and the Bible says they were all waiting for the moving of the water. Verse 4. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? But today I want us to go back to verse 1, and this is where we're going to begin. And when you come to John chapter 5, verse 1, again it says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. Before you can really go into this story, you have to understand where was the pool of Bethesda, and why was Jesus in that area of Jerusalem on that day. Well, when you come to the old city of Jerusalem, there is a gate. It is a very ancient gate. Today it is called the Lion's Gate. Previously, it was called Stephen's Gate because just outside that gate is where Stephen was stoned to death. We can read about that in Acts chapter 7. But if you leave that gate and go down the Valley Kidron and up the hill, you come to the Mount of Olives, which is a site which Jesus went to very regularly. But if you leave the Mount of Olives, come down the Kidron Valley, come back up and enter into that gate, you enter onto a road which today is called the Via Della Rosa. And the Via Della Rosa runs along the back side of the ancient temple wall. It was a very secluded area. It was a very exclusive area. It is not an area where people normally would be wandering. Why was Jesus in that area on that day? And the answer really is very simple, and most people miss it. If you walk from Stephen's Gate or the Lion's Gate on the Via Della Rosa toward the old city of Jerusalem, as you walk, most people are just headed straight to the Pool of Bethesda, and they miss something very important. On that road, if you look to the right, there is an ancient building. And in that building, you can read right on the facade of the building, this was the place where the Virgin Mary's mother was raised. Now, most people never think about the fact that Jesus had grandparents. <laughs> Jesus had grandparents. And that is where Mary's family lived. And so it is likely that Jesus had come into that vicinity of Jerusalem where most people did not go to because his grandparents lived there. And as Jesus exited his grandparents' house, and by the way, today, if you're ever in Jerusalem, you can still go there and go very deep, deep, deep under that building, and you can see a first century house, which is reputed to be the home of the Virgin Mary's mother, Jesus' grandparents. But as Jesus exited that home, he turned and began to walk to the right, and as he walked to the right, he passed the sheep gate. That's what this verse calls it, the sheep gate. And if you pass through the sheep gate, just beyond the sheep gate, there were two pools. They were connected. Each pool was about 50 by 50. And these pools originally were filled with beautiful, wonderful, clean, pristine water that the locals believed had medicinal powers. They believed it had medicinal powers. In the city of Jerusalem, there were only two natural sources of water. This was one of them. There was not a lot of natural water in the city of Jerusalem. But because the water was so pure, the water was so clean, and the people generally believed that if you bathed in these waters, it had medicinal powers that you would become well, the wealthy of the city said, we want this for ourselves." They built walls around it. And they developed it into what we today probably would call the country club of the very elite of Jerusalem. And because it was very near to the temple facility, 
Even when the priests were finished serving in the temple, they would walk across the road to the pool where they would bathe and they would swim. And this became the place where the intelligentsia, the wealthy, the educated, frequented regularly. It became their place of habitation in the city of Jerusalem. And in fact, so many wealthy people were coming into this place and were bathing in these waters that they decided they would develop it. So they put mosaics around the edge of the pool. It was simply fabulous. And because the people wanted to eat there and be served food, they began to build porches, which we would call covered colonnades. And they added one covered colonnade, and people kept coming, so they added another one and another one and another one and another one until five. Finally, there were five covered colonnades which completely surrounded these bodies of water. And if we had been allowed to peek into the world of the first century, we would have seen the wealthy, the educated, the famous, sitting under those covered colonnades with the terracotta roofs on beautiful mosaics, eating food that was served to them by servants as the rest of them were swimming in the warm medicinal waters. But by the time that you come to John chapter 5, something has happened to this place. The spring in the bottom of this pool dried up. And because it dried up, no water flowed in, no water flowed out. That's very important. No water flowed in, no water flowed out. And the waters became stagnant. Well, you know what stagnant water looks like if you're in a vicinity where the temperatures are very hot. It becomes disgusting. And because no water flowed in, no water flowed out, there was no movement of the water. The water began to turn green. It began to grow horrible things. And the wealthy people said, this is no longer a place fitting for us. And they abandoned it. And by the time that you come to John chapter 5, it is a dilapidated, abandoned place. And now it is thickly populated with sick people. And it is the sick people that have named it Bethesda. That was not the original name of this place. The name Bethesda means the house of grace, the house of goodness, or the house of mercy. Something was happening in this place so fantastic. Sick people came there and they renamed the place the house of grace, the house of goodness, the house where God's goodness is poured out. And now if you would look at verse 3. And verse 3 tells us, in these, you understand, in these five covered colonnades lay... A great multitude of impotent folk. Even the word lay is very important. It's the Greek word peri, kemai. The word kemai means to be stacked. The word peri means around. They were literally stacked all over the place. If you've ever seen a picture of crocodiles that are all in one place laying on top of each other, that is what these sick people looked like. Sick people butted up against sick people, laying on top of sick people. So thickly populated, it was difficult to even walk through these covered colonnades. And look who was there, a great multitude. In Greek, this is the word oklus poulos. Oklus by itself describes a massive multitude. The word polus is a modifier. It means it wasn't just a great multitude. It was a great, great, great multitude. Hard to even imagine how they packed so many sick people into this place. They were like sardines in a can. And the Bible says impotent folk... And then it names specifically halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. The word impotent is the Greek word asthenios. The word asthenios generally describes people that are bedfast, people that are homebound, or people that are financially stricken. And here we have a picture of sickness. Sickness takes your health, it takes your comfort, it takes your money. These are people that have been deprived on every level. And then the Holy Spirit gets more specific and tells us the blind, the halt, the withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Well, these are very important categories. The blind, the Greek word tuflos, it was believed in the first century that the blind could not be healed. This is why the healing of the blind was considered to be the greatest miracles in Jesus' ministry. No one had ever seen the blind to be healed. 
But secondly, it says, the halt. Now, what would you think the word halt means? The word halt is actually the Greek word, which means maimed. These were people who had lost a limb in some kind of an accident. And then it says, the withered. The word withered in Greek is the word zeros. And indeed, it is where we get the word zero, which means these were those considered to be big zeros in the eyes of society. These were useless eaters. These were non-contributors to life and to society. These were big zeros in the eyes of the population. That is who populated this place. And now they're all laying in this place. And the Bible says they're waiting for the moving of the water. But wait, 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 there's a problem. Because there's no longer a spring in the bottom of this pool. No water flows in, no water flows out. Why are they waiting for the moving of the water? And because it has five covered colonnades, the body of water is completely encircled, which means even wind does not have the ability to move this water. And yet all of the sick people are here laying on their sides in one direction, all of them focused on the water, and they're all waiting for the moving of the water. The word moving is even important. In Greek, it describes a fierce, fierce agitation. It would describe water moving in a circular fashion, moving and moving and moving and swirling and swirling and spitting water all around the sides on the people. This is not a natural movement of water. And the next verse says, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool. When the Bible says went down, it is the Greek word katabino. The word katabino is the Greek word which means to step down a set of stairs just like this right now, which means an angel literally stepped down, almost like he was stepping down steps, but he was stepping down into the pool. And the Bible says he came at a certain season. It was an unpredictable season and troubled the water or fiercely troubled or stirred the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. The word whole is the Greek word, which really means he got his life back again. He got his life back again. Then you come to verse 5. And a certain man. By the way, in Scripture, when you read a certain man, when the gospel writers were writing their gospels, if they wrote a certain man, it meant that person was still alive at the time they were writing the gospel. A certain man, we all know this man, we all know his testimony, you know who I'm talking about, a certain man. This was still a living testimony when John wrote this book. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. Notice it says he had an infirmity. But the Greek word had in Greek is the word echo, which means to hold, to possess, or to be held in the grip of, which means this man really did not have an infirmity. The infirmity had this man. He was in the grip of this infirmity. The word infirmity, again, the Greek word asthenios, which means one that is bedfast, homebound, one that has been stricken financially. He has lost everything that he has due to his sickness. This man has been deprived on every level. And my friend, I want to tell you, sickness truly is a thief. It takes your time. It takes your attention. It takes your care. It takes your money. Sickness really is a thief. And this man and all of the people in this place had been robbed by infirmity. And the Bible says he had been laying there for 38 years. Well, we already know something about this man. This man came there in faith. He heard about this place. Miracles are happening at a pool in Jerusalem. The sick people are congregating in Jerusalem. And this man who was asthenios, he was bedfast, he was homebound, probably against the wishes of his family. 
was transported from his home to the Pool of Bethesda where he took his place alongside of all of the other people that were crammed into this place. He came there in faith because he heard it was Bethesda. It was the house of goodness. It was the house of grace. It was the house where God's mercy was poured out and where miracles took place. And he came there in faith believing he would be one of the next to receive a supernatural touch of God. But when Jesus walked into this place, this man has been laying there for 38 years. 38 years. You know, the book of Proverbs says, hope deferred does what? Makes the heart sick. This man had waited and waited and waited and waited. And because he had been there for 38 years, he had seen so many miracles take place. He had seen people go into the water, come out of the water healed. In fact, he could have written a book called The Miracles of Bethesda. But he was just a spectator. He had never received his touch until Jesus came. And the next verse says, when Jesus saw him lie, everybody say saw. If you have an ink pen or a pencil, underline or circle that word saw. This word saw, the Greek word horeo, which means to examine or to scrutinize. To examine or to scrutinize. When Jesus saw this man, he fixed his eyes on this man. He examined this man. He scrutinized this man. He discerned the man's situation. And Jesus saw him do what? Lie. He was physically lying down. But Jesus saw beyond that. Jesus saw that inwardly this man had given up hope. And on the inside, this man had laid down. When Denise and I first moved to the Soviet Union almost 30 years ago, we could not have moved our family into a worse situation. It was dire. The shops were empty. Those of you that are old enough to remember the news, you can remember the long bread lines of people waiting to buy bread. That's what we moved our family into. There was no flour. There was no sugar. There were no eggs. There really wasn't even gas for the car. Sometimes you couldn't even exchange dollars for rubles because there was no rubles. There was a deficit of everything. You would walk into a pharmacy. The shelves were completely empty. They had not had medication for years and years. It was a completely dilapidated, socialistic system. I said that for your behalf. And back in those days, everyone wore dark clothes, military colors, and we would see people walking on the streets all humped over like this. They couldn't stand up straight. It's walking like this. And our hearts would nearly break because it's so difficult to walk all the way down the street like this. Do you know today we don't ever see that? It's gone. You know, I hope came, and when hope comes, it affects your physical posture. You begin to stand up when you have hope. We don't see that any longer. And they were not just hunched over back in those days because of a physical condition. It was spiritual. It was an oppression that was literally causing them to bend. And today, we don't see that anymore. Well, when Jesus saw this man... Horao, he examined, he scrutinized, he really discerned this man's situation. Jesus saw not only was he physically lying, but inwardly, this man was lying down. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew, hmm, knew that he had been now a long time, long time in Greek is the word chronos, it's where we get the term for something that is chronic. Jesus knew this was a chronic condition. He said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The word whole is the same word whole, which is translated in verse 4. Jesus literally said to the man, Do you want to get your life back again? Would you really like to have your life back? Well, it's really a very unusual question for Jesus to ask. 
Of course the man wants to get his life back. That's why he's there. He's been there for 38 years because he wants to be healed. He wants to be made whole. He wants to be normal again. So why in the world would Jesus ask him this question? Because Jesus knew he had been now a long time in that case. This was a chronic condition. And in 38 years of living in the pool of Bethesda and laying alongside of other infirmed people. This man's identity had changed. He saw himself as a person that was infirmed. That infirmity became his identity. He thought like an infirmed person. His language was the language of an infirmed person. What do you suppose he and his neighbors talked about every day when they woke up in the morning? How did you sleep last night? How do you feel today? I don't feel too good. How do you feel? Did you have a bowel movement? No, I didn't. How about you? Have you had yours? What do you think they talked about? They talked about their infirmity. They saw themselves as infirmed people. Their language was the language of infirmed people. They thought like infirmed people. But not only that. This man has lived on the good graces of the social security system for 38 years. People have been feeding him. People have been providing for him. This man has not worked a job at least in 38 years. And if this man gets his life back, it's not just a matter of feeling good again. He's going to have to get up and walk out of that place. And when he walks out of that place, guess what? He's going to have to choose new friends. He's going to have to learn how to think like a well person. He's going to have to develop a brand new identity. He can't think like a sick person. He can't talk like an infirmed person. And not only that, if Jesus gives his life back to him again, he's probably going to have to get a job. And to get a job, he may have to have some education because it's been 38 years at least since he's had a job. That changes the whole picture. Any pastor will tell you, everyone says they want to change. That's the easiest prayer in the world to pray. God, help me lose weight. (laughs) The sincerity of your prayer is revealed when you walk past the refrigerator. Or how about someone who says, oh, God, I want my husband to be saved. Then he gets saved, and the wife no longer controls the home spiritually like she once did. And she'd kind of like to put it back into its former condition because she doesn't know how to live and behave in this new spiritual environment. You have to understand that when Jesus does a work in your life, it changes your life. It changes the way you think, the way you see, the way you talk. It even means you have to choose new friends. And when Jesus saw that he had been now a long time chronos, chronically in this condition, Jesus understood the chances were that maybe this man was just speaking words he didn't really mean. Even though his situation was bad, at least he had acclimated to his life. He had learned to adjust to it, even though it was not the best. At least he had friends there. He had learned how to live there. And there are many people in life, my friends, who have acclimated to their infirmity. And they've learned just how to get along with it. And when they understand what they have to do to be healed or to change, they choose just to stay where they are. Because that's too painful. That's too hard. And so Jesus asked him, Wilt thou be made whole? The Greek literally says, Do you want to get your life back again? What do you want? Look at the next verse. And the man answered him. The word answered in Greek means the man answering. It means the man began to run at the mouth. He began to tell a story. And the man answering and answering and answering and answering and answering said unto him, I have, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I'm coming, another steppeth down 
before me. But notice the first thing this man said to Jesus. He called Jesus what? Sir, old King James word. In Greek, it is the word kurie. The word kurie is the direct form of the word kurias, which is the word for Lord, the one with absolute authority. I will do anything and everything you tell me to do. And this is key because you will never change until you accept the authority of Jesus Christ to tell you what to do to change. You have to submit to him and be willing to do anything he tells you to do. And when this man called Jesus, sir, he really said, Lord, you're the one. You know what to do. I'll do whatever you want me to do, but let me tell you my story. And he said, I have no man. That's what people still say. I would change, but I don't have anybody to help me. I would change if my wife would change. Well, I would change if my husband would be the spiritual leader. I would change if I had a church that cared enough to even call on me when I'm not at church. I would change, but this person's not there. That person's not there. I have no man. It's still what people say. He said, I have no man. To put me into the pool. This is so pitiful in Greek because the word put into is the Greek word balo, which means to pick up something like a ball or a rock and throw you over into. And then he adds, I have no man to throw me or to hurl me over everyone else into the pool, but while I'm coming, so now he's getting dramatic as he's describing his dilemma. I'm dragging my body to the edge of the water when I see the water is moving. And just when I'm almost in the pool, plunk, somebody else is in the water before me. If I just had a man to pick me up and hurl me over everyone else's head into the water. It's just a typical counseling session. You ask somebody a very simple answer, and they give you a very complicated answer. Answer. Jesus said, do you want to be healed? And the man begins to tell the life story. So what happens in counseling sessions all the time. You ask a simple question, and people always want to give a complicated answer. Jesus simply said to him, what do you want? Do you want to be made well? The only thing this man did right was he called Jesus Lord. And because he get called Jesus Lord, Jesus said to him in verse 8, Rise, pick up your bed, and walk. Jesus had the authority to say that to this man. Because the man recognized Jesus' authority. And Jesus saw through his complicated answer. And likewise, I want to tell you, when you give Jesus some complicated story. He can see your faith. He can see your desire. He can hear what's really there below all of that nonsense. And Jesus said to this man, rise. And the Greek here is so strong, it is a command, which means Jesus was nearly yelling. He was trying to get the attention of this man. It's just like in Russia when people come for prayer. And of course, you're willing to pray for them. But they want to tell you this long, long, long story that you really don't want to hear. All you need to do is pray for them. And sometimes you just have to interrupt them by saying, tell me what you want. You've got to break in on them. And now Jesus interrupts the man's story and simply says, rise. Take up your bed and walk. And the word walk is the Greek word peri patel. The word peri means around. The word patel means to walk. It means get moving, start walking around, pick up the thing you've been laying on, and get moving, get walking around. Get walking around. And immediately, the man was made whole. The Greek says the man got his life back. That is a literal translation. The man got his life back and took up his bed and walked. The Greek word again, peripete, he got moving. He was walking around. And the Bible says, and the same day was on the what? The Sabbath. Verse 10. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured. The Greek says, the Jews therefore said unto him that got his life back again. It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. So bound by law, they couldn't even see the grace of God that had been poured out right in front of them. Amen. 
they basically said, hey, this is not a good time for you to change. Get back on the bed. Get back on the bed. Now, you would think that when a great miracle takes place, everybody would rejoice. But let me ask you, how many of you have experienced a great work of God in your life and not all of your families were happy about it? You know why? Because change threatens a religious spirit. A religious spirit is not necessarily connected to religion. A religious spirit is a spirit that likes everything just to stay the way that it is. And when you change... Those around you that are not changing feel very exposed. And rather than rejoice in you changing, they may say to you, have you forgotten who you are? You are one of us. How dare you tell us you're going to move away from here, get a different job, go to Bible school, be something different, get back on that mat. You are one of us. That's a religious spirit. You have to also understand it was the Sabbath day. And on the Sabbath day, the Jews believed that you were not able to do any kind of work or any kind of effort. You couldn't burn a fire on the Sabbath day. On the Sabbath day, you could only walk a Sabbath day's walk. No work on the Sabbath day. That is why today, if you go to Israel... If you ever stay in a very tall hotel and you're there on the Sabbath, be very careful which elevator you get on. Because there are Sabbath day elevators that are pre-programmed to stop every floor going down and every floor going up because the religious Jews believe it takes too much work to push a button on the elevator on the Sabbath day. That's work. You can't push that button on the Sabbath day. That's how religious they are. And you're not supposed to walk but a few steps on the Sabbath day. And what is this man doing? He's carrying his what? His bed. What are you doing? Do you not realize what day this is? You are working. This is forbidden on the Sabbath day. And not only that, Jesus said to him, Peri Patel, get moving. This man is not just taking a few steps. He's walking and walking and walking and walking and walking. He's violating every rule. And remember what was near to the pool of Bethesda? The temple. This man walks out of the pool of Bethesda carrying his bed. He is walking. He is getting moving to such an extent that he turns left, swings onto the temple premises where the most religious of all people were. He's walking and walking and walking, carrying his bed in the midst of the most religious of all. And they all lose their mind. What are you doing? Get back on the bed. Do you not realize this is the Sabbath day? This is not a good day to be healed. This is not a good day to change. Get back on the bed. And the Bible tells us what happened next. And he answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed did not know who it was. Now, can I just throw in something interesting for you here? Daniel, this will be really good for healing class. The word healed that is used in this verse is a totally different word. This is the word that is primarily used to describe the healing ministry of Jesus in the four Gospels. It is the Greek word therapeo. Do you hear another word? What word do you hear? Therapy. That is the word used 90% of the time to describe how Jesus healed the sick. Most of the time when the Bible says Jesus healed him, or Jesus healed him, or Jesus healed him, the Greek says therapeo, Jesus literally translated therapy to him. Well, how does therapy work? A therapy makes the patient do something, right? The therapist says to the patient, if your hand is messed up, you've got to use your hand. Do something with your hand. And when the Bible says Jesus therapied him, this explains why Jesus would say to a man with a withered hand, 
stretch forth your hand. How do you stretch forth a withered hand? A withered hand is like this. It's bound. You can't use it. But Jesus said to the person with a withered hand, do something with that hand. He required some kind of physical participation. And when the sick would begin to participate, that's when the power of God would begin to work and they would receive their healing. That is 90% of the time how Jesus healed the sick. He always required them to pick something up, stretch something forth, do something that you can't do. Primary way that Jesus healed the sick. And this verse literally says, and he that was therapied. And doesn't that fit this verse? He picked up his bed. He had to do something. And he that was therapied knew not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. But look if you would at verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him where? Oh, how could this possibly happen on the Sabbath day? Jesus found him in the temple. Wasn't hard to find him because everyone was standing back in shock as the man breaking the rules came walking through the Sabbath, walking further than you're supposed to walk and carrying a bed. And the Bible also says here, Jesus did what? Find of him. Don't you love the King James Version? Jesus findeth him. The word findeth is the Greek word heurisko. The word heurisko is the Greek word for a scholarly research or an investigation. It is where we get the word eureka, which means Jesus was not finished with this man. Jesus was not going to leave until he followed up on this man. Nobody is better on follow-up than Jesus. And if Jesus is committed to follow-up, we need to be following up on people as well. Jesus was literally saying, find me that man. I'm not leaving these premises until I lay my eyes on this man. And finally, when Jesus found him, it was a eureka moment. Jesus was so glad. Well, here he is. And Jesus said unto him, listen to this amazing statement. Behold, thou art made whole. The word behold is the Greek word edu. Almost impossible to translate in English. It really means wow. Wow. It's the same word Jesus used in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, when he said to the disciples, Behold, I give you authority over serpents and scorpions. Same Greek word, which means Jesus was so excited about what he was about to give to the disciples that he said, Wow, what I'm about to give to you is amazing authority. This word describes a loss of words, bewilderment, astonishment. Now Jesus is standing in front of this man, and when Jesus looks at this man, Jesus says, Wow, that is amazing. How many of you want Jesus to look at you and say, Wow, what a transformed life. Jesus wants to lose words when he looks at you. And Jesus said to this man, Wow. Thou art made whole. Your life has been restored. Then he says, sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. Jesus was basically saying to him, go, go back to your old place and do what you used to do, or this thing will come back on you again. When your life has been changed, you can't go back to where you were. You can't have the same friends. You can't talk the same talk. You have to think different. You have to live different. Jesus was commanding this man, it's good that you feel well and things are back on track, but now everything has to change. And in fact, when he says in this verse, sin no more. The word sin in this case doesn't refer to sin. You know, some people say, well, people get sick because of sin. Well, in this verse, it doesn't even really mean sin like that. It means don't make any more mistakes. Don't keep making the same mistakes. Don't keep doing the same thing that you've done. Lest a worse thing come upon thee. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which made him whole. The Greek says it was Jesus which gave his life back to him again. 
Now, how many of you learned something new today from John chapter 5? Is that just amazing? All of that happened probably because Jesus went to see his grandparents that day. You need to go see your grandparents. It'll be amazing what will happen if you spend a little time with your grandparents. Healing comes on all different kinds of levels. Some of these people were blind. Some of them were maimed. They were zeros. They were non-contributors. Some of them were financially broke. People can be sick in their minds, sick in their bodies, sick in their souls, sick in their relationships, sick in their marriage. And just learn to live with it. If that's you, you're the one that Jesus is saying, what do you really want? I'm here. Do you want to stay the way you are? Or would you get, like to get your life back again? Would you like to get things back on track again? And what happens to you depends on whether you're willing to call Jesus, Sir, Lord. You're the one with the answer. And I'll do anything you tell me to do. And if you'll submit to him in that fashion... He'll say to you, hey, it's time to rise. Pick up that thing you've been laying on and get moving again. He will restore your life to you. That's what Jesus will do for you.